Good morning, Lakeside Community Church. You know, the words um, come, come, uh, are, are very appreciated where we are invited somewhere. Come, come be a part of this. And so uh, that's the invitation we have this morning, to come and take part in the presence of the Lord, in the, in the praises of God together, and I invite you to join with us here. Would you go ahead and stand as we worship our King together? Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and His might, O oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light and canopy space. His chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is His path on the wings of the storm. That's right, you alone. You breathe in the air, you shine in the light. Oh, measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to worship above. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and Let's sing again now. You alone. For you alone are the matchless king. To you alone be your majesty. Your glories and wonders what tongue can recite. You breathe in the air. You shine in the light. You alone. You breathe in the air, you shine in the light, shine in the light, you shine in the light. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Is he worth our praise, Lakeside? Put your hands together, please. Amen. Oh, the name of Jesus is so wonderful to say it and to sing it. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. You are the light to my heart and my soul. You are the light to the darkness around me. You are the hope to the hopeless and broken. You are the only truth and the way. No sweeter name, no sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have 
pray. I'm going to start with Isaiah 25, 1. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. That's right. We know you have plans for us, Lord. We know that you are in our life daily, moment by moment. And we know that you have every second planned out. Lord, we know that you know every hair on our head, whether we have hair or not. And we know that you know every time we are going to be sick, every time we are going to have a need, that we are searching for you every moment of the day. So I lift up the prayers of this community. I lift up the prayers of this church, the needs that are coming, the needs that are currently going on. I pray for... Kathy and the upcoming um, appointments and doctors and we just pray Lord for your time and your will to be done Lord and I pray for Jane Lord for her upcoming surgery when that will be and and again just knowing the timing for all these events and there's many needs um, outside of our community people who are sick going through mental health crisis, financial crisis. The prayers are just a long list, Lord, but you know them. You hear them. You hear us every day, and I thank you that um, you are with us every moment. Oh, Father God, thank you. Thank you so much for Lakeside Community Church and their donations, the food and the drinks that you provided here, Lord, the people that volunteered. Thank you for Kathy showing up and saying hi to everybody. I know it wasn't easy for her. Father God, you're so good. Again, Lord, um, I just want to thank everybody for all they did. Six $6,700 yesterday. Amen. I know that was all from you, Lord, touching everybody here. They have such wonderful hearts. Father God, I would like to pray for the Weatherly family, family that 
Michael Weatherly passed away. I went to Bible study for 20 years on Thursdays with him. He will be missed, Father God. So just be with that family today, Lord. Uh, they're still mourning, and they still miss him. But, Father God, they know where he's at, and I can't wait to see him again. Amen. Father God, uh, uh, I would just thank you for all you do for me. Give me the strength to get through each day to just do what I need to do at home and then at work. It's not easy, Lord, but you get me through it. As my worker says, when I tell him I got to go alone to do this, he says, you're not alone. You got Jesus with you. Amen. And I never forget that. This is a, 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 a brother that doesn't come to church, but he knows the Lord because he works side by side with me. and He watches everything I do. So that's a testament there that, that I got to stay focused on you, Lord, because people are watching. And I want to thank you for Bible study this morning, Lord. It was awesome. Thank you for Pastor being back there and, and sharing his thoughts on how to teach us, Lord. Again, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the service, for Tim and all that he does. Thank you for communion today. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So in the time of Noah, God destroyed with the flood. And Noah was a representation of Christ, a righteous man. Well, then there was a period of time from Noah when men went back to their evil ways. And so phase three comes into play that God would call and rise up a man named Abraham. And God would establish through Abraham his own people, his own nation, Israel. Abraham has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. But God knew they needed to go through a time of testing. So he allows them to come under the slavery of the Egyptians for over 400 years. And that 400 years, part of it is for us today because that 400 years represented slavery, which represents slavery for us in sin. So God comes through Moses, another representation of Jesus, and he brings them out of Egypt. But it took that last plague, the plague of death. And he tells his people, take an unblemished lamb, basically a perfect lamb. Take the blood from that lamb and put it on the doorframe of your houses. And when the angel of death comes, he will pass by and spare you of death. But on this night, Celebrate the Passover meal, the night that the angel of death passed over you to save you. Communion is like that Passover meal. Every year they were to celebrate to remember what God had done for them, brought them out of slavery. Well, the Passover meal is a representation of Christ's perfect blood shed on the cross for our sins. And as they put the blood on the door frames of their homes, Jesus' blood is put on the door frames of our hearts. That death will pass over us because of his blood that was shed. And Jesus told his disciples, before he was going to be crucified. Remember what I'm about to do. Just like he told the Israelites back in the day, remember what I'm doing to get you out of Egypt. Remember what I'm doing to get you out of sin. That's why we do communion. That's why we remember. Let me pray, and then I'll ask the elders to come. <clears throat>
Father, we thank you for your word. We are reminded how important it is to understand uh, the biblical theme of the Old Testament and how it plays itself out today. That Jesus, you came as a man, you gave up your throne, you lived among us for 33 years, and ultimately you sacrificed yourself for our sin. Because we are in sin, O oh Lord. And there's nothing that we can do to get ourselves out of it. Only you coming here and sacrificing yourself, your blood is what cleanses us from sin. It sets us free. Just like the Israelites were set free from Egypt, we are set free from the bondage of sin. We still struggle in sin, but you tell us to confess it and that we'll be clean. And so this communion table, Lord, represents forgiveness. It represents what you've done for us on the cross. And as we partake, we agree and we acknowledge, God, we're broken, we are weak, and we need your help. So let us, Lord, come now to the table. For all believers who claim to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, who are not perfect, but yet they understand their need for you. Bless them now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus stood before his disciples and he said, this bread, which represents my body, will be broken for you. And so he said, take and eat and remember that my body is being sacrificed for your sins. Amen.
can only imagine the disciples were locked in to every word Jesus was saying. Just like we need to be locked in today as we partake in this Lord's Supper. And once again, as he stood before his disciples, he took the cup and said, this cup represents my blood, which will be shed on the cross for your sins. So take and remember that it's Christ's blood that has come to set you free. We come together in this way to do such a thing because Jesus is worth it. We sing of his praise. We tell of his glory because Jesus is worth it. But somehow it seems as though as, as great and worthy as Jesus is, sometimes you think, God, we can't even measure how worthy you are because you're so good and so worthy of praise and so great and awesome. But we're going to try and do our best. Above all powers, above all kings, Above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, Above all wonders the world has ever known. Above all wealth and treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucify, lay behind the stone. We live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above all. Above all power, above all king, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdom, above all throne, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, but there's no way to measure what you were. Crucify, lay behind the show. You live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall. Would you stand, everyone? Crucify, lay behind the show. You live to die, rejected and alone, like a ghost, trampled on the ground. You took the fall. I 
like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all how about we take some time silently Again, it's so hard to, to measure the worth of God. <laughs> but let's try in our time of silent prayer. Let him know how worthy he is, how good he is. Express that now. Lord God, we um, are really trying. We, we, we want to know you more. We want to love you more. And the more we know of you, we realize how awesome and wonderful you are. And that just makes us want to praise you and worship you more. And so we, we hope, God, that in our humble gathering, as we are having right now, that what we give to you certainly is worthy of your greatness that you God would look upon your children and be pleased with what you see pleased with what you hear because God it's all about you <laughs> so God thank you for who you are and what you mean to us we just want to give to you God our very best and we want to give to you our all because, God, everything that we do have, all that we have, is from you. So thank you. Thank you for being our redeemer, our friend, sustainer. Thank you for being our hope. And we continue to praise you in our service of worship right now. Glory be to your name, Jesus. We are on you. There we go. We choose to be thankful. So we have already mentioned in, in song and in prayer uh, different things for which we're thankful. We'll bring this down just a little bit for us, please. And, and I must also just say how grateful we are for 
last night. And Sharon, the many who helped organize this um, event, this fundraiser, Joe had mentioned the funds that were raised. That's of the Lord. What a blessing. So thank you for those who helped put it on. Thank you for those who are part of this. Thank you for those who continue to pray over Joe and Kathy. And God is good. Keep on praying. Uh, it looks like there is momentum and, and progress. And God, your will be done. So uh, speaking of Sharon, um, stranger danger alert. There's someone sitting next to her, or at least who's been with her, we don't recognize. We haven't seen in a few months here. Larry McKillop, welcome back here, uh, brother. Good to see you. So, Larry, appreciate your keeping uh, tabs on Lakeside through live stream. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, now that Larry's here, a uh, happy 49th anniversary, belated 49th anniversary to you and your bride. So congratulations, there, brother. So um, uh, uh, for those not only here in our presence, but uh, on live stream, we're so glad to have you worshiping with us. And I, I want to make mention of some other things uh, in regards to this um, dinner, this fundraiser, that uh, um, there are some things, there are some things that are left over from last night. And if you are interested, after our service this morning, feel free to go over to the social hall and see Sharon and she'll kind of divvy out some of the things that are left. But also, uh, what was mentioned earlier, the fact that Kathy showed up, she made an appearance there. That, you know, I, I didn't get the wonderful privilege of being there, but I heard about it and what a wonderful, wonderful thing. So we praise God again, just for uh, that, that I hope was an encouragement to her, but encouragement to those who got to see her. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So happening uh, this week, everyone, the Lakeside Ministry, we have our Bible study happening again on Wednesday, 630, uh, that Roger is leading. Meeting God is the focus. And then Saturday, the whoever, whoever shows up breakfast club, uh, they're going to be meeting at uh, Chubby's. Uh, so again, I know you're watching Sharon Dibble. Not only do we still miss you very much, but thank you for uh, coordinating that. And um, I do want to make mention, not this Thursday, but the Thursday following, the 13th, our elders and deacons will be meeting. So 13th, um, we'll meet together. And so let's make mention of some, oh, I do need, need to make mention the ladies uh, Thursday. They are uh, having a Bible study at Amy McMahon, so 630 on that Thursday, Amy McMahon's. So let's go ahead and make mention of some uh, birthdays and anniversaries. So uh, Jim and Linda. Happy anniversary coming up. How many there, Jim? 52. 52. Ooh, all right. <clears throat> Praise God. Praise God. And then, uh, kind of all in the family here, Joe and Amy, they have an a anniversary coming up as well a little bit later in the week. And then birthdays. So uh, we have Nathaniel, who's going to be having a birthday tomorrow. Nathaniel, how old? 17 years young. All right. All right. And, and then Jane, happy birthday to you coming up. And so happy birthday. Uh, whatever you do to celebrate, jump up and down, right, to celebrate. Next year. But next year by this time. Okay. All right. Well, at this time, we are going to invite our children to go to Children's Church. Have a great time, kids. While they're being dismissed, keep on going there, kids. I do need to make mention, there's a pair of glass that have been up here for a while, uh, and nobody has claimed them, saying, hey, have you seen some glasses? And so if you are missing any, please come see us. Or maybe they were brought just so that they can be put into uh, uh, our maybe container back there for uh, used glasses. So if we don't hear from anyone, it's going there. All right, Stan. There was this movie about the world had gotten so out of control that it was, it was dog eat dog just to survive. And um, there was this guy 
who had this book. It was a powerful book. One, one guy who was super, super evil, he wanted this book. Because if he had this book, he could control everything. So the movie's about this evil guy trying to get this book, but this evil guy had a wife who was blind, and he treated her terribly, terribly. Well, over time throughout the movie, the, this guy gets this book, finally. He gets this book. He brings it back to his home or whatever, and he thinks, yes, I got the book. But the guy who had it was a good guy, and you didn't know it, but the guy was actually blind. But because he had the book, he had power. So the guy gets the book, brings it back home. He opens up the book, and it's all in Braille. So he tells his wife, you need to read this book for me because she's blind and she can do Braille. And she's like, wait a minute. You've been treating me so bad. I'm not going to tell you what it says. The guy just loses it. Eventually, he, he loses his life. But the guy who did have it before, he goes on to this place, this museum where... They're trying to hang on to the most precious things, preserve them. So he goes there. He finds a guy who's, who writes. And so what he does, he lays down and he tells the writer everything that was in that book by memory. The book is the Bible. From Genesis to Revelations, they wrote it down, preserved that book so that it would last forever. Why do I start off with that story? Because the Word of God is so powerful. If the whole universe rebelled against the Word of God, it would lose because the Word of God created the universe. The Word of God created everything. That's why we gather in church to study the Word that is powerful and will always be powerful forever and ever and ever. It's the Word of God, and, and because we're sinful, because we're broken, the Word of God has to convict us out of love. It's a conviction of love, and that is why we come to read the Scripture, to study the Scripture, because the Word is meant to set us free. So let's go to part two of Do You Really Love Your Wife in Ephesians 5. We'll be wrapping up Ephesians 5, and just, you know, I don't know, just for the fun of it, we've been in Ephesians 5 for over two months. We'll jump into Ephesians 6. My goal is to get Ephesians 6 done by the end of the year, and then... <laughs> <laughs> the end of this year. And then the Lord would lead into another book. And I'm thinking maybe one of the Gospels, I'm not sure. But for right now, let's look again here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, 
For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about the church, Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Let's pray. You know, Father, for whatever reason, I have really sensed the past three weeks a different level of spiritual oppression, spiritual battle. And I've wondered why. And I'm wondering, Lord, if it's because Satan knows if he can destroy the marriage, he can destroy the family, and he can destroy society. And so the enemy does not want us to seek truth in these topics of a wife submitting to her husband or a wife loving his wife as Christ loved the church. And so I think that's why the spiritual oppression has been more intense. But I thank you, Lord, for this place. I thank you for this holy ground that we are on. Lord, we're, we're all in this together. We're all broken. We're so weak. It is your truth. It is your word that gives us strength. It is your word meant to set us free. Lord, the world wants to chain us up, but not you. You want to set us free. Set us free this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So there were some kids between the ages of 7 and 10 who were asked some questions about Love and marriage. And kids sometimes have the funniest insights on love and marriage. Here's some questions and here's some comments from some kids. When asked, how does a person decide who to marry? Well, Alan, 10-year-old, said, you got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports... Should like, she should like it like you like sports, and she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> now, Kirsten, age 10, replied, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all be way before, and you've got to find out later who you're going to be stuck with. <laughs> Another question. What do most people do on a date? Lynette, age eight, said, Dates are for having fun, and people should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you listen to them long enough. <laughs> Martin, age 10, said, he has some youthful wisdom here. He says, on the first date, just tell each other lies and that usually gets them interested enough to go on a second date. <laughs> Another question. Is it better to be single or married? Anita, age nine, says, it's better for girls to be single but not for boys. Boys need somebody to clean up after them. <laughs> Kenny, age seven, says, it gives me a headache to think about that stuff. I'm just a kid. I don't need that kind of trouble. <laughs> Another question. Why love happens between two people? Jan, age nine, says, no one is sure why it happens, but I heard it has something to do with how you smell. That's why perfume and deodorant are so popular. Harlan, age eight, says, I think you're supposed to get a, sh get a shot with an arrow or something, but the rest of it isn't supposed to be so painful. 
Well, what is, what is falling in love like? Roger Eisenstein says, like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. <laughs> Greg, age eight, says, love is the most important thing in the world, but baseball is pretty good too. <laughs> and then, um, when is it okay to kiss someone? Pam, age seven, says, when they're rich. Kurt, <laughs> Kurt, age seven, is more cautious. The law says you have to be 18, so I wouldn't mess with that. <laughs> Howard is a bit more responsible. The rules go like this. If you kiss someone, then you should marry them and have kids with them. It's the right thing to do. Jean, age 10, says, it's never okay to kiss a boy. They always slobber all over you. That's why I stopped doing it. <laughs> and then lastly, how to make a marriage work. Ricky, age 7, says, tell your wife she looks pretty, pretty, even if she looks like a truck. Bobby, age nine, says, be a good kisser. It might make your wife forget that you never take out the trash. <laughs> and then finally, Roger, eight, says, don't forget your wife's name. That will mess up the love. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Those were fun. So we're continuing with the question. Husbands, do you really love your wife? And we've seen that Christ-like love should characterize each husband's relationship with his wife. Last Sunday, we looked at you know, part one of husbands loving your wives, and we looked at how love is the priority for husbands, but not the authority. Authority is not the priority. Love is the priority. And love also is portrayed as self-sacrificing. Just like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a sacrifice that Christ made, and we are to emulate that same kind of standard as husbands. Love is caring. And just as a man nourishes and cherishes his own flesh as Christ does the church, it's caring. It's also a commitment as implied by the command to love by Christ's covenant love for us and, to, and by the analogy of the body. It's a commitment. And also love shows itself, not just by words, but by action. As seen in Christ going to the cross for us. And then love seeks the highest good for the one loved. That just as Christ died for us, that he might sanctify and cleanse us to present us to himself in all our glory to make our wives holy and blameless. And we also looked at two of the ten contrasts towards the end of the message last Sunday to help us understand God's perspective on a husband's love for his wife. We, we looked at love as sacrificial. It's not selfish. You know, we talked about how Jesus, you know, he, he crucified himself. He allowed himself to be crucified for his bride, the church. And how that is a Christian husband's same standard. To crucify his own self for the, for the, for the love of his wife. And then we looked at love as purposeful, not aimless. So we're going to now focus on the on the, the other eight contrasts this morning. And so this is where you're in, you're in your bulletin here. And the first thing that we're going to see is that love is realistic, not blind. Actually, my, my bad. I, I think I put something wrong there. Sorry, Tim. Um, it should be blind. Love is realistic, not blind. 
And we know, we know there is no perfect bride who is without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And guys said under their breath, Amen. But it is not unrealistic to strive for such a bride. It's just like the Christian life. We're not, we're not going to be perfect, but we strive for perfection. Just as a husband understands, my wife's not perfect, but you know what? I'm going to strive that she is perfect or to help make her perfect. And a godly husband accepts his wife for who she is. And he graciously and he patiently works with her to help her become all that God wants for her. That's a part of Christian godly love. And the fact that the wife is far from perfect doesn't diminish a husband from loving her. To remember, husbands are to love their wives just as Christ loved the church. And what kind of church did Christ love? Was she perfect? Or close to it? Hardly. Even as Jesus went to the cross, Peter denied that the disciples would fall away. And look at your own life since coming to salvation. Have you perfectly observed Christ or obeyed Jesus? Have you, has your love for him always been enthusiastic? Have you always kept yourself pure and devoted only to him? And yet, in spite of your many failures, he loves you beyond comprehension. So husbands, we need to remember that. Our wives aren't perfect. We have not obeyed the word perfectly. See, many times couples who go to marriage counseling will blame each other. I have mentioned that before. He blames her for being angry. And she blames him for being indifferent or insensitive. Now, speaking only to husbands here, your wife is imperfect just as the church is imperfect. But Jesus calls you to love her anyway with a love that helps her grow in godliness. Think about Hosea, who loved an unfaithful wife named Gomer as an example of God's love. Think about how God came to Hosea and says, Hosea, you're going to marry Gomer. And Hosea, she's a prostitute. I want you to marry her. He marries her. And what does Gomer do? She continues with her prostitution. And Hosea constantly brings her back. And God is telling Hosea, Hosea, see, this is like me and my people. They're like prostitutes. But I keep bringing them back. So we see that love is realistic and not blind. The second thing we see is love is, is uh, initiating not dependent on a response. See, the book of Ephesians, or all the scripture for that matter, really, is clear that, that God took the initiative in loving us and drawing us to him for salvation. And one of the most common heresies is that God's sovereign election only means that he looked down through history and saw that I would believe, and so he chose me. But that would mean that 
election was not based on God's grace alone, it, but, but on some good that he foresaw in me. But Scripture says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's hard to love people when they make your life miserable. But that's what Jesus does. He loves us in spite of the fact that we're sinners. Now, applied to husbands, this means you must constantly initiate and demonstrate self-sacrificing love to your wife regardless of her response. Even if she's being disagreeable or difficult to live with, if you respond in anger, it only makes the wall thicker. You guys experience that. Love takes the initiative. It is not dependent on a response from a loved one. It's like, I'm going to wait until she does something really cool. Then I'm going to love her. doesn't work that way. The third thing is that love is unconditional, not conditioned on performance. See, this means steadily maintaining love over the long haul, even when your life seems unlovable at times. See, many husbands have said things like, she's an angry woman and, and she isn't submissive to me. And if she just calmed down and submit as she's supposed to, I'd be able to love her. Guys think that way. There's some guys who think that way. But the husband's job is not to get his wife to submit to him or to have her only when she is lovable. He is to love her just as Christ loves an often disobedient church. Does that make sense? And this does not mean that you never confront your wife in regard to her sin. See, some husbands, they'll, they will, they'll run from their wives' anger. in order to get some relief. And then there's other husbands, they'll confront their lives with anger, with an even more fiercer anger, to let them know they cannot be intimidated. And neither approach is godly. See, a Christ-like husband is not quarrelsome, but kind and patient, even when wronged. In 2 Timothy 2 24, 25, it says, And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that's how Christ deals with his bride, the church. That's how a loving husband must deal with his wife, even when she is not all she's supposed to be. In a real Christ-like manner or world, a husband's desire is to come alongside his wife and to help her understand. He should be able to say, your anger does not glorify God. I want to help you to be godly woman. Let's see what God's word says about how to overcome anger. And both husbands and wives are thinking right now, yeah, right. <laughs> what planet are you from? But the problem is, most, if not all, husbands have not earned the right to speak or to act that way. Fourth thing, Love is a total sharing of life, not two independent lives. 
Paul says in verses 28, 29, I'll read it again. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. And Paul is not saying that husbands need to love themselves so that they can love their wives. His point is that your wife is part of your body, just as the church are members of Christ's body. And a husband and wife are one flesh. When you love her, you're loving your own body. And it's an amazing picture that a wife actually is part of the husband's body. And Paul is more than likely going back to the creation of Eve. She was not created out of the dust of the ground as Adam was. She was taken out of his body, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh. And so then this has a huge impact or implication for Christian marriage. So in essence, if your wife is hurting, you should be hurting. If you are insensitive to her pain, you are ignoring your pain. If you, are, if you coldly ignore her feelings and say, I couldn't care less how you feel, you are ignoring yourself. And if you attack her with harsh words, you are attacking yourself. It would kind of be like if a man hit his thumb with a hammer. He would say, you stupid thumb. Why did you get in the way? You deserve to hurt for being so dumb. I'm going to hit you again just to teach you a lesson. Doesn't that sound foolish? Because that would be crazy, and yet that's how many men treat their wives. And the fifth thing is love is responsible not irresponsible. Paul says husbands must feed and care for their wives' body just as Christ cares and feeds the church. And you see, this reveals two ways, at least two ways, that a husband must demonstrate responsible love for their wives. First is this, is that love provides. It's not lazy. See, the word feed is another word for nourish. And every man feeds his own body. Every husband, then, is responsible to feed his wife, which includes material provisions or basic needs. And our culture has taught men to be lazy for the purpose of breaking down society. And nourishing or feeding also implies providing emotional and spiritual food. This means you take your wife and your children to church every Sunday. You make sure that they're getting the instruction of the word through Sunday school or Bible reading at home, praying together as a family, talk about to God together regularly. You know, I remember, I can still remember those days when I was a child and when all five of us kids would be with mom and dad around the kitchen table back in the day when that's what you do, would do. And after the meal, mom would break out the Bible and she would read a chapter. And kids being kids... We're, you know, messing around, laughing. And then my mom would always say, Dad? (laughs) And my dad, jokingly, but in seriousness, would pick up the pan of potatoes and say, Hey, do I got to knock you over the head with this pan? That's when we knew. Listen to mom. 
But see, I still remember how valuable that time was. And we have gotten so far away from that. And the second thing to being responsible instead of irresponsible is love is caring, not callous. See, the word cares also means cherishes, which also means warmth. And just as a husband cares for his body, he also cares for his wife by providing warmth. See, if your hands get cold on a winter day, you don't say, stupid hands, stay out of the cold, I don't, for all I care. No, what do you do? You stick your hands inside the coat pocket and you warm them up again. So responsible love nourishes and cherishes your wife. The sixth thing is that love is emotionally mature, not immature. See, in verse 31, Paul quotes Genesis 2.24, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. See, this was written about Adam and Eve. Neither of them, now neither of them had a father or a mother. So it was given for our instruction to show us that a man must be mature enough to leave his parents before he gets married. And there are many husbands out there who expect the same treatment they got from their own mothers, from their wives. They expect the wife to clean the house, buy their groceries, manage the money, basically take care of them while they go play with their buddies. That is obviously immature, to say the least. A husband must leave his parents so that he can be joined to his wife and lead her in a mature and responsible manner. He should be the leader not her little boy. Seventh thing is, love is a permanent commitment, not a temporary arrangement. See, in verse 31, and be united to his wife means to be glued to her. This means that when you get married, like that little girl, you're stuck. And marriage also means one flesh, rain or shine, good or bad, joy or sadness, is to be worked through together. And even married couples should remove divorce and separation from their vocabularies. Even through heated emotions, never threaten to leave. Now, unfortunately, there are times when divorce is the only option. And again, it's, it's unfortunate because either one or the two or the both of them did not carry out their, spirit, their biblical responsibilities. One failed the other or whatever. So divorce happens. And because marriage isn't about happiness... It's an earthly picture of Christ in the church. So a husband threatening to leave his wife is like Jesus threatening to leave the church. Think about that. Heaven forbid that Jesus would ever leave the church. So why should husbands leave their wives? But he himself said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And those are the same things we need to have with our wives. And love, and, and love is an exclusive intimacy, not a casual relationship. Again, in verse 31, lays the foundation of marriage as a one flesh relationship. And when God instituted it, it was between a man and a woman, not between two people of the same sex. See, we're living in a day when the, sex, the same-sex movement is at the peak of society, none like it has ever been before. And what it boils down to, it's a lie from Satan. 
And just as Satan said to Eve, did God really say you should not eat from that tree? He says the same thing. Did God really say? You know, one of the things I, I, I feel that the church, the whole church in general has failed and how it has dealt with people who struggle with this. That the church thinks for some reason that those struggling with the same sex mentality, that they've, that they've gone to a whole different level of, 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 of ungodliness or whatever, and, and they seem to forget that there are many men in the church, even church leaders today, who are engaged in secret porn. Or gossip. Or whatever. God doesn't look as, yeah, there's a level here that I'm not really cool with, or eh, that's not too bad. God sees it as sin is sin is sin. And that we need the word of God to help us the bottom line, no matter what we struggle with, porn or gambling or, or whatever, is you got to bring it to the cross. Say, have mercy upon me, Jesus. I'm, I'm broken. I'm struggling. I, I, I want to be set free. That's why Jesus came, to set us free from the things we struggle with. And it's also between one man and, and, and one woman, not one man and many women. Although God tolerated polygamy in the Old Testament, it was never part of his original plan for marriage, and it always caused problems. There was never a success story of a polygamy relationship. And the same is true of divorce that one man and woman to be joined exclusively for life. And I get it. Marriage is hard. And part of the reason why marriage is hard is because society makes it hard. And because we're selfish people. See, the one flesh refers primarily to a sexual reunion or union. Paul says that even when a man has sex with a prostitute, he becomes one flesh with her. And God designed sex to be an intimate, one flesh relationship that is meant to last a lifetime between a husband and wife. And casual sex outside of marriage is never about love, but always about lust. See, marriage is a great mystery. It's, 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 that in a, it's that earthly picture of Christ in the church. And you probably never associated sex within a marriage as an intimate picture with our heavenly bridegroom. When sex takes place between a Christian and a husband and wife, it's very natural and it creates no guilt. And just like the peace you get when you come to church and seek to live a godly life, there is no guilt. See, part of the mystery of marriage is that there is no marriage in heaven. Why? Because we will be married to our heavenly bridegroom for all eternity. Therefore, we must guard ourselves so that we keep ourselves sexually pure for our mates because the picture of Christ in his church is at stake. Let me, um, let me close with a story. A husband was listening to a tape where the speaker cited the biblical text about husbands being thoughtful of their wives. He emphasized that love is an act of the will. A person can choose to love. It convicted this husband who realized that he had been pretty selfish and insensitive. So he drove to join his, his family on their vacation cottage or at their vacation cottage. 
He vowed that during this vacation, he would try to be a totally loving husband. No excuses. He resolved his, his, his resolve, excuse me, was immediately tested. After the long drive, he wanted to sit and read, but his wife suggested they go, they go for a walk on the beach. And he started to refuse, but then he thought, She's been alone with the kids all week, and now she wants to be alone with me. So he went for a walk on the beach. So it went on for two weeks. He resisted the temptation to call the Wall Street firm where he was director to check on things. He agreed to visit the Shell Museum, although he usually hated museums. He held his tongue when his wife's Slow getting ready made them late for a dinner engagement. For two weeks, he kept his vow to choose to love his wife. But on the last night of the vacation, as they got ready for bed, his wife stared at him with sadness, that with saddest expression, what's the matter, she said. He asked, her voice filled with distress as she said, do you know something that I don't? Well, what do you mean? Well, that checkup I had several weeks ago, our doctor, did he tell you something about me? You've been so good to me. Am I dying? <laughs> After it all sank in, he burst out laughing and said, no, honey, you're not dying. I'm just starting to live. Amen, Amen to that. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for navigating us through these um, sensitive topics. No matter what is being preached, it has to be the pure word of truth. God, we live in an evil time. All we got is your word. So thank you, Lord, for reminding us of, of the picture that you want us to always have in our minds and our hearts. That our, 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 our marriage relationships, or even just our, our loving relationships in general, need to emulate the relationship you have with the church. You died for the church. God, we live in a time when, when society is trying to get away from the original plan of what you set in place. And it doesn't mean things will get better. It means things will only get worse. So we must stand for truth and understand, again, we, none of us have it all together. We're all broken. We're all dealing with our own stuff and we must bring it to the cross because there are always consequences when we don't. So give us the courage and the strength to live the life you called us to live in the name of Jesus, amen. Did you pay the cable bill today? No. Didn't you have a lunch break today? Welcome to That's So Mature, the game show for married couples who want to go the distance, beat the odds, and put the relation back in their relationship and build a loving and lasting godly relationship. What do you say? Want to play? Absolutely. When is dinner? Super. The rules are simple. When you hear this buzzer, you have the opportunity to rephrase a thoughtless comment and make it thoughtful. A chance for a meaningful conversation rather than a meaningless one. Scott, let's start with you. Welcome to round one of That's So Mature. That's So Mature. Scott, 
you began the conversation insinuating that your wife should have been able to pay the bill while she was at work. How can you rephrase that and make it more positive and engaging encounter? Um, hi, um, sweetheart. Uh, why didn't you have time to pay the bill today? What? What's wrong with that? The answer we were looking for was, how was your day? How was your day? That's implied, I isn't it? Okay, all right. Um, how was your day today, sweetheart? Super, excellent work, Scott. Now, Sharla, your turn. Answer this question. How was your day? Well, I went to work this morning. And as I was driving, there was a guy driving next to me in a Honda. No, it wasn't a Honda. It was a Datsun. Wait, no, they don't make Datsuns anymore. You know what? What was the car that your cousin Rip drove? You know, the one that we always said looked like a pregnant ferret? Anyway, he was wearing the same colored shirt you were wearing. So I got to work and I walked in like normal and Diane was sitting at the front. Wait, I wasn't even halfway through my day. Exactly. <coughs> No one needs uh, that many details. The question was, how was your day? Not, give me a doctoral thesis on your day. Sharla, try that again. Well, babe, to answer your question, um, I went to work and I ran some errands. I actually had a lot more errands than I thought I would have, which was not stopping me from having a productive day and included having lunch with my mom. Super work. Nicely done, Sharla. So, what's for dinner? What? What's wrong with that? What? I'm starving. And it's her night to cook. Yeah, I'm not really clear on that either. It's um, breakfast for dinner, by the way. Awesome. Love it. First of all, Scott, don't think with your stomach before you think with your heart. Take the time to let her know that you're happy she had a good day. Isn't that obvious? I mean, why wouldn't I want her to be happy? Well, sometimes I don't really think you care too much about my day. Oh, of course I care. I'm sorry. I should tell you more that I care, babe. I got this. Honey, what can I do to help you with dinner tonight? Nope. That was me. I slipped. I'm sorry. That was a really brave offer, babe. I think you mean helpful, not brave. No, I, I think she's referring to the fear I have with those biscuits that explode when you open them. How embarrassing. And that brings us to the lightning round. That doesn't sound good. Two negative. Sharla, go. I'm confused. <laughs> Excellent, Sharla. Good to express your confusion. Scott! Can I have a biscuit? May I have a biscuit? This is not English class, Scott. Do, do you want a biscuit? Excellent. Generosity always wins. Hi, hi, babe. Ah. Hello? Isn't there a cash prize or something? When um, you know we can take you know really important topics and and yet still have a sense of humor about them, um, but thank you everyone for coming. So we got through the wives, we got through the husbands, and guess what? Next week, kids. No children's church. It's all about you <laughs> next week. God bless you, everyone. Please stick around the social hall for some refreshments. Thank you for Brian and Christina Roberts for providing that. Have a great week. Amen. Are those yours? No, let me express myself a little bit. Oh. Do you have those glasses for me, man? <laughs>